Good morning. Welcome to Sabbath School. Good morning. morning. It may be few in numbers, but we're mighty in spirit. <laughs> the road to faith. Road. I've traveled many roads in my life. I know the road to Palm Desert, the road to Palm Springs. I even know the road to Yosemite. Mm -hmm. I know the road to Spokane. And I know the road to home. A lot of roads uh, we're familiar with, but today is the road to faith. Road to Faith. Uh, I have the white notes. And uh, there's a note here that, uh, that I like. I'm going to share that with you this morning. There are deep mysteries in the Word of God. There are mysteries in his providences and there are mysteries in the plan of salvation that man cannot fathom but the infinite mind strong in his desire to satisfy curiosity and solve the problems of infinity neglects to follow the plain course indicated by the revealed will of God and pries into the secrets hidden since the foundation of the world. Man builds his theories, loses the simplicity of true faith, becomes too self-important to believe the declarations of the Lord, and hedges himself in with his own conceits. Many who profess to be the children of God are in this position. They are weak because they trust in their own strength. God works mightily for a faithful people who obey his word without questioning or doubt. The majesty of heaven with his army of angels leveled the walls of Jericho before his people. The armed warriors of Israel had no cause to glory in their achievement. All was done through the power of God. Let the people give up all desire for self-exaltation. Let them humbly submit to the divine will, and God will again manifest his power and bring freedom and victory to his children. So, we have those with a simple faith and believe in the promise. And then though we have those that want to exalt themselves and have a compl complicated formula to arrive at the same place. Sometimes we make things too complex. When I was born in this country, we had a free country. I still think it's a free country, but it's as free. We've complicated things. We have tried to figure out how to take money from the rich man and distribute it to the poor man. And uh, in the transfer, the government keeps most of it. So they made it complicated. In, uh, in the history of our country, it used to be the churches that took care of the poor and, and the hungry. And we took the commission from Jesus Christ very seriously that God will help us aid the hungry. Man had responsibility for their neighbors. And 
nowadays, the uh, big, uh, big phrase is, let the government do it. But what did, what did Jesus say? He said, I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was naked, and you clothed me. And so forth. And isn't that our duty as Christians? And, yeah, the Lord says on the judgment day, he's going to uh, be talking to the people who thought they've done mighty things in God's name. They healed the sick and they've, they've preached the word and uh, they've done great deeds. But he told them, I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty and you didn't give me anything to drink. I was naked and you didn't clothe me. I was sick and you didn't come visit me. And so on. And those folks were probably, well, when? We didn't see you hungry, Lord. We didn't see you thirsty. He says, well, you didn't do it to the least of these. And when you neglected them, you didn't do it for me. The road to salvation is not complicated. It's very simple. Do the things that the Lord asks you to do. And I think it's so sad that on that day so many people think that they have salvation but don't. And so many of those that think maybe they don't have salvation do. The road to faith. What can you accomplish without faith? You do not believe your automobile is going to take you from the church back home today. Would you keep that car? If you didn't have faith that this pew would hold you up, would you sit in it? We have faith. Sometimes things are wrong. My, uh, when I was a boy, my Aunt Hula and her two brothers, Otto and uh, Oberlin, lived in the house their father built. They were all born in that house. My grandfather was born in that house. And most of the furniture in that house had belonged to my great-grandparents. And my great-grandfather passed away in 1939, and my great-grandmother passed away during World War II. And those, those three remained in the house. And that furniture was there in the house. And uh, my Aunt Hula was always gracious when she had company in the house. She was full-blooded Norwegian, and she thought that anybody coming into her house deserved a nice cup of coffee. It didn't matter if they were four or five years old, or 25 years old, or 95 years old, they were served a cup of coffee in her house. And, uh, and uh, she had great confidence. But the reason why I'm going into that is I remember one day I was uh, playing in the yard there. My mother was sitting down at the table with my Aunt Huda. And all of a sudden, I saw in the window, I saw my mother disappear. And I went running for the house, and so did my sister. And there was my mother sitting on the floor. 
that old, old chair from the 1880s finally decided it had been letting enough people sit on it. And it gave way. But my mother had faith that that chair would hold her up. And it did for about a half an hour. But it just, that's when, that's when it decided to go. Yeah, I know just how she felt because I bought a chair that made my back feel good that I had at the office. And my boss liked it so good, he bought one just like it. Well, one day he was sitting at the desk and he just happened to put his feet up on the desk and that chair collapsed. Mm -hmm. Boom, it wasn't any good anymore. And I thought, well, at least I don't put my feet up on the desk, so I'm fine. But one day, that chair just decided it had enough of me, and I was sitting on the floor. <laughs> I had faith. But you know, the Lord isn't ever going to let us down. Amen. We have man-made uh, man uh, products. We have man-made uh, ideas. And you know, in so many cases, we have man-made religion. And, you know, if you partake of that man-made religion, it may support you for a while, but in the end, you'll be sitting on the floor. You will not, uh, you will not uh, uh, be sustained. The Lord God has given us true religion, true faith, and a true formula for salvation. And uh, we start putting in some of these man-made ideas and some of these man-made connotations of what you have to do to be saved, to have, uh, have, uh, have salvation. Well, when you sum it all up, Jesus has already paid for our salvation. Mm -hmm. He's paid the price in full. And our account is made paid, is marked paid in full. And yet, we're not to just sit there and do nothing, are we? There's great things that we have to do. I always uh, remember my uh, grandmother and her sisters, and even my mother, if they heard of a big bargain, those telephone lines were busy. And, and uh, many times those, uh, those uh, ladies would descend on the store at the same time and, uh, and buy up those bargains. And they all knew about it. But if it wasn't something so exciting, they wouldn't bother to tell anyone. Well, I tell you and I ask you, what is more exciting than being saved? What is there in this world that is more exciting? Yet, if we buy a new car, we're showing it off to everyone. If we uh, find a new place to live, we're telling everybody about how astute we are in finding that place to live. And we'll describe it in detail. And, uh, and, uh, and I've seen more of these uh, here in the Coachella Valley than anywhere else I've ever stayed is we have all these popular native communities where people move in there because they're safe. And yeah, I remember summer 1980, the first summer I lived on the desert, they had these gated communities and the people would leave for the summer because they liked the weather elsewhere better than when they came back in the autumn. So many of them found their houses had been gone through and many things were taken and stolen from them, even though they were living in a gated community. 
and they finally got down to the bottom of it. Here are these wealthy people, have all their nice stuff, and they had guards on the premises, but they paid the guards a pittance. And usually people who work for higher wages are more trustworthy than those that work for lower wages. <laughs> and in their abundance, they made sure that those guarding their stuff just received a pittance. Well, they decided to get even, help themselves. What good did the gate do them? Excuse me. Yes. It's like the parable of the good shepherd. You yes. know, the parable of the good shepherd, the higher men will run away when they see danger, like a yes. wolf attacking the, the sheep. Yes. But the good shepherd, he gives his life for the sheep. I mean, That's because right. not. He's not there because they're paying him. He's there because he loves them. Yes. I've been involved with, uh, with uh, several chambers of commerce in this desert. I've been uh, uh, involved with so many other places. And there's, uh, there, there's a certain number of people that, that are just really surprised when they find out that I live in Desert Hot Springs. Desert Hot Springs? Aren't you afraid to live there? No, I'm not afraid to live there. I said, and I said that, you know, my house is right out in front of the sidewalk and anybody can walk up to my door and knock on it. And, uh, and chances are, if you're living in a gated community, they can't do that, or I should say not. And, and then I'll, I'll ask them and they'll tell me where they live. And I said, well, you know, if it's so safe here in Palm Desert, or wherever they say, why do you have to have a wall and a gate with a man standing at the gate wearing a gun <laughs> if Palm Desert is so safe? I said, in, in Desert Hot Springs, we, we pretty much know how to keep our house safe and we don't need a man with a gun at the gate into our community mm -hmm. and still know we're safe. And I said, well I never thought of it that way. And then I really give them a zinger. So I, I follow the statistics and uh, this was a few years ago so it might have changed a little bit but at that time I tell them well it wouldn't surprise you a bit if I told you that the city of Coachella is the number one place for murder mm -hmm. in the Coachella Valley. Oh no, that wouldn't surprise me at all. But what do you suppose is the number two place for murder Pond in the Coachella? Yes. And they'll say, they'll say, right, it's a desert hot spring. Yes. And you're right. I don't know, it's Palm Desert. Palm Desert? Well, we don't care about that. So, well, you know, anything that happens in desert hot springs, the desert sun is going to proclaim in big, bold headline, headlines. And, uh, and there's so many advertisers where their business is in Palm Desert or Palm Springs that they don't dare broadcast that because the business people want Palm Desert to look very Perfect. safe. Perfect. They say, well, why would it be, why would it be that there's so many murders in, in uh, Palm Desert? I said, well, there's so many rich people and they have kids that want to speed up their inheritance. You'd be surprised how many people kill their parents or kill their grandparents. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and um, I know of a case uh, where I, I talked to some folks and they, uh, they had come down and had murdered their sister. She was well off. She had made a lot of money. And they decided that uh, they, uh, they wanted to get that. The best way was to take a ball peen hammer and hit her in the head with it. They're in jail now long time to come. Norma? Well, I think all of those things are part of Satan's plan. Yes. And if we love the Lord and we really follow the, the law is there to guide us and to tell us what is right and wrong. Yes. And all of this that you're saying 
gated community don't mean a thing to be break into any place, everybody's house. That's right. We trust in the Lord. Amen. And he, we have to have faith. And that's the main thing. Amen. We, we just can't worry about all of this. We have to just believe that the Lord will be with us. If we, Amen. If we get in our car to go somewhere, we pray, Lord, send your angels to guard us today as we travel. Amen. We have to have this faith, Tom. Yes, and we do. All of this about all of the un unsafety we're living right now, very close to where a lot of them the new marijuana businesses are mm -hmm. and we could be worried to death but we're saying lord protect us mm -hmm. and if whatever happens then we have to consider that god understands mm -hmm. and if yes. we're living right we still have salvation mm -hmm. and you've the arrived Jesus christ you have arrived at the conclusion i want you to arrive at that is good i'm glad to hear that amen but we have all these side roads and Jesus wants us on the road to faith. Mm -hmm. We need to keep in mind what God has told us how to live. Yes. And have the faith to believe it. Amen. And live the life that God wants us to live. Amen. Yes. I'll read another quote from the White Notes. Christ possessed the power to break the bonds of death. He declares that he has life in himself to quicken whom he will. All created beings live by the will and power of God. Amen. They are recipients of the life of the Son of God. However able and talented, however large their capacities, they are replenished with life from the source of all life. He is the spring, the fountain of life only he alone hath immortality, dwelling in light, and life should save. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it up again. Amen. John 10, 18. Amen. Jesus Christ is our Savior, our King. He's our doctor. He's our, uh, our advisor. He is our helper in time of need. Amen. He is our all in all. Amen. I think that's the best way to describe that. And yet so many of us want to confine Jesus Christ to a compartment yes. in our life. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of 7-Eleven Christians in this world. <laughs> you ask, well, what do you mean 7-Eleven Christians? Well, they meet once every seven days at 11 o'clock. And they meet for an hour. And that's the time they spend with the Lord. And the rest of the time they do whatever they believe. And they're uh, far away from Christ. And yet they think they are religious. I know, I know people that, that go to church regularly. They go every Christmas and every Easter. And they consider themselves regular attenders. And so many churches really like that. They like to brag. Well, we have this many people here on Easter. We have this many people on Christmas. But how many did they have the week before Easter and Christmas? And how many did they have the week after Easter and Christmas? What kind of impact did they have? Did they really reach those people? They may have, in a way, that uh, where is the power? Where is the proclamation of the Lord in those kinds of statistics? And, and can you be proud that maybe you have 40 people at the worship service 50 times a year? And two times a year, you have 150 instead. And you swell the church, and it's full. Well, I'll put it in a simple way to understand. At least anybody that's influenced like I am. Every day, all 
all through the year, you get to eat about a fourth of them up, a fourth of the amount you'd like to have to feel comfortable and to feel well fed. And two times a year, you get to eat all that would make you feel comfortable and full. What kind of a life would that be? It'd be crummy, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. How do we sustain God's house when we just have the few? When uh, we could be uh, sustained by many. But then on the other hand, you look at these mega churches where they have 10,000, 15,000, 20,000 members that are part of the church. And they come there to be entertained. Oh, that music is wonderful, the soloist. And oh, the pastor makes me feel good with how I live my life with his nice, smooth, soft sermons. And this and that. I've been in some of those mega churches. And they do everything to, to drag people. I was in one in, uh, in San Bernardino where they had a coffee shop where you could sit in the coffee shop and drink these exotic coffees while you're attending the service. You can watch the service from inside that coffee house uh, where they, they have those nice exotic coffees for ten or fifteen dollars a cup. And uh, and they have other things going on. While the service is going on, some people they don't want to sit in there and sit with everyone else. I uh, I remember doing a uh, funeral for a man and his daughter finally asked him because she noticed that almost every time he went to church, there was a baby sitting in front of him. And she says, well, well Dad, why, why do you always sit behind the baby? And he says, well, you never know what a baby's going to do. And it's interesting. And you know exactly what the minister is going to do. And, uh, and the baby is more interesting than the pastor. A form of religion, but denying the power thereof. And I dare say there are some people in our church that is the same way. It isn't the name of your church that is going to give you salvation. It is your relationship with Jesus Christ. Is he truly your friend? Or do you just show up out of obligation? Thinking of it as fire insurance. Insurance to keep you from burning <laughs> in, 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 the, in the last day when, when the, what is it? Do you love Christ? Do you fear Christ? Well, Jesus Christ wants us to have faith. Amen. He wants us to have faith in Him, belief in Him. And like Norman was saying, it's the end result. And we need to trust Jesus Christ to take us, take care of us in all of these things. We need to pray and we need to ask him to keep us safe. Yes. We need to make time. We need to make time. Make time every day to have our relationship with him. And this way we will get to know him personally. Yes. Well, I'm going to tell on my Aunt Violet right now. I'm going to tell on you, Aunt Violet. God has promised to be the husband to the widow and the father's father to the fatherless. And I told her that when she lost her husband of 40 years. And she told me when things didn't go right, she lectured God <laughs> and told him what she thought. But you know, that's just what the Lord wants. Amen. He wants us to tell him what's wrong. He wants us to tell him when we're happy. He likes to visit with us. Amen. It's, it's, uh, it's like this uh, person that I knew that got married and was quite happy that she got married. And then uh, uh, they drove off 
to go home. And her brand new husband told her, well, I'm glad we're married, but I don't want to move in here. I want to stay living at my girlfriend's house where I've been living. And within the week, that marriage was annulled. Mm -hmm. If he was going to be married to her, he needed to be married, and he needed to stay at home. He couldn't live with his girlfriend and be married to her. No. And you know, that's exactly what some of us do with God. We show up every seventh day at 11 o'clock and spend our obligated hour with God and then all the rest of the day and all the rest of the week we're off to the races, we're off to whatever we're doing and we're having a blast and we leave God out, we don't even talk to him. So you can just see how God feels. What, what is he getting out of relationship? No, God wants us to talk to him, even if he gets lectured by us. At least we're talking to him. We're telling him our troubles. Yes, Sister Ruth. And, and not only talk to him, but he also would like for us to tell others about his love, his care, his kindness, how we depend on a God. We don't depend on human beings. Because without him, Jesus says, you cannot do anything. That's but right. uh, we can do everything through Christ who strengthens us. Yes, yes. We need that faith in the Lord, and we need to tell about it. When there's something exciting in our life that happens, we're anxious to tell people. Mm -hmm. we're, 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 uh, we're very excited by it. But all in all, that road to faith is not complicated. But we as human beings have made it complicated. Jesus laid down his life Amen. to save us. Jesus paid the price. Yes. Because he loved us. And how would you feel if you went and paid off someone's house and they kept going around. Well, I have to work hard because I have to pay for my house. And yet you paid for their house. And how would you like them going around saying, well, I have to pay for my house. And, and, uh, and they should be uh, going around saying, you know, my best friend paid my house off. I don't have to pay for my house. I can use this money for the Lord's work, or I can use this money for other necessary things. But my house is free and clear, thanks to my friend. Amen. That's what we need to hear. Well, our time has expired, and uh, and uh, Brother Charles, would you pray for us as we uh, complete our Sabbath school today, please? So we are, yes. The Lord is here. In your name we come unworthy, but we are thankful that we've had a chance to fellowship and to study your word. Mm -hmm. As we meditate, as we think about it, we pray that our minds will be receptive and that you will receive all of our power and glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. amen.